Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining our first webinar of the series for this year. And the first one is on uh, the Tessa T Cozy and how we can achieve zero carbon retrofit at scale. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, so I'm Isabel Beattie, I'm the director of Beattie Passive. Um, I don't know if Ron wants to introduce yourself. Yeah, Ron Beattie, managing director of Beattie Passive. And Ken. And I'm Ken Mercer, national sales manager for Beattie Passive. Thank you. So throughout the um, presentation, feel, please feel free to drop any questions down in the Q&A box, which I think you can find on the bottom of your screen. At the end, we will have a sort of 10, 15 minutes of questions. Um, so I'll be collating those and then asking Ron at the end. Um, and Ken will also be following up with any that we don't get time to cover. Um, so please do feel to you know, drop those down as we go along. We will try and get through as many as possible at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Right, I'll hand over to Ron. Thank you very much, and it's nice to uh, to have a chance to talk to you all today. Uh, to start off with, I just want to go through a bit of history for those who don't know about BT Passive and what it's trying to do in the industry. Uh, it was started some 11 years ago, where I struggled to uh, deliver on one of the Code 6 developments that I was trying to build at the time. Um, and it set me on a journey that really made me understand that uh, the difference between what we're trying to achieve and we design and the performance gap is just growing. And with all the efforts that I made over a two year planning period, I couldn't deliver. Um, and I really wanted to come up with a new system of building that allowed us to build any building shape to um, deliver on passive house, but deliver better fire and sound and durability. And that system had to look at both the new build and the retrofit, because as we all know, we've got a, a massive uh, job ahead of us to look at our existing stock and see how we can bring that up to, uh, to meet the uh, carbon agenda that we're all under. So it's been now nine and a half years since we've done our first retrofit. Um, and that one I'm pleased to say is still performing as well as it did. Uh, and uh, we've cut the running cost there by over 80%. So it's a journey that I'm going to share with you today, and I think it's really important that as we go forward uh, with our retrofit plans, we really understand the issues that are, are facing us. Um, as you're aware, as you're aware, um, we've got climate change has now really come on, and although BT Passive have been screaming about this for the last 11 years, uh, it's now at the forefront of all of our minds. And, you know, most of our councils and HAs have all got a, a, a carbon emergency on. So we're looking at our existing stock and our new build as how we can actually change that. We've got the poor quality of homes and unfortunately this is getting worse. Um, we've retrofitted some buildings really poorly and I'm going to go into that in a moment. But we have got excess amount of mould. We've got cold syndromes, fuel poverty. And the cost to the NHS just in these three things without the illnesses is just going to grow and grow. And as we go forward with these price rises on energy costs, um, I think our problem is going to you know, grow, grow even faster than we would have readily expected it to. So how are we going to deal with it? What are we going to do? Um, and the biggest issue we've got, of course, is cash. How do we pay for it? Um, we'd love to love to have a great big piggy bank of money which we could all delve into and zero carbon our homes but that's really difficult to do but what we have got to do we've got to do it properly and i really believe that if we just do it piecemeal uh, which we're intending to do and i understand the reasons why we're going to be throwing that money away and we're not going to get any of the carbon savings that we require so if I take you on a journey now about what BT Passive believe in and what we're doing, um, and perhaps we can help you on your journey. So most of you know about uh, EWI, external wall insulation. It's stuck to the existing walls and it's rendered over. Uh, and when it's done properly, it's done well. Um, but it's never up to the sort of size of insulation. It's never at the U value that's going to really reduce the amount of energy that we require. And that's the problem. We need to do it at a level that's going to drastically reduce the energy that requirement in that building. Um, and if we're just sticking bits of insulation around the building with joints and gaps, like you can see on these photographs, we are never going to be able to achieve that. And what we're also doing is causing problems because when we get a gap, 
we then get uh, mold growth because we've got a cold and a warm area hitting each other. So we've seen a rise in um, asthma in newly retrofitted homes of about 40%. Now that's huge. Just think the way that things are gonna go if we don't get it right and don't start to um, retrofit our homes properly. And the other thing that we don't want to talk about, and I must admit it's not a nice subject, is radon gas. Um, we've been stuffing our homes up with EWI, we've been cutting our air bricks, we've been not ventilating properly. And when you, one of the most important part of retrofitting is actually ventilation. Uh, radon gas is a killer. We all live with it, we all deal with it, it's in our bodies every day. If we live in areas from Bath up to, um, up to Glasgow, then it's quite uh, prominent. Um, but it's everywhere. And as we get our houses to be more airtight, we're going to find that um, that becomes more of an issue. So ventilation is one of the most important parts of doing a retrofit and making sure that we stop that mold growth. We actually get healthier buildings. Um, and I think that's going to become a more prominent part as we go forward in our retrofit programs. So how are we going to do it? We've just finished out last year, finished one of a block of flats uh, where we uh, taken a 1950s building um, and that had concrete overhangs in the balconies and the roof. So we had really bad um, conductivity between hot and cold and thermal bridges. And we put a new skin over the top and that's called our tea cozy. It is actually taking an existing building and putting a new building over the top. And this is about doing a deep retrofit. It's not an easy job. Um, but it is a one fix. You're not going to go back in that building for 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years. And that's where the costs come in. It's those costs that have got to be taken into account with the roof maintenance, the new window maintenance, the servicing of that building and the upgrading of that building. Um, so we want to look at the low hanging fruit first, the properties that need money spent on them, and then work our way up that property chain to deliver more and more good quality retrofits. We've carried out now uh, a series of retrofits and we've been developing BT Passive Tea Cozy. Uh, the system itself now uh, has been, de been delivered um, in flats, houses, um, and it's been designed that it's gonna be done offsite where we've got our factory and I believe the future of a lot of our building and a lot of our retrofit does lie offsite. Um, but also on site. And the two I'll be explaining to you today show you that you can actually turn up with a van uh, and have five main components, or you can manufacture it all in a factory and then drop it on and be out of there in a, in a matter of days. So they both got their benefits. We can't get cranes everywhere. Uh, and what I will do to you today is show you those different types of, uh, of retrofit. So, how do we do it? What is Tea Cozy? So if we can imagine we've got an existing building, which is 1940s, 1950s, it's solid wall, it may have a cavity, um, it, it may have um, uh, window repairs to do, roof coming to the end of its life, it may be that it's just been done. But these are the buildings that we're picking at the moment and uh, we're doing around ooh, two or 300 around London soon. So um, I'm sure that all of you will be very interested to come and visit and see what's going on. Um, so we've got an existing building. We're going to take off the tiles of that building because one of the things we've got to do is get an air tightness. We're going to reduce the air tightness from something like 13 or 14 down to around about one. We can't always do that because we're going to be pepper potting properties and we're going to be working up against buildings and properties that have been sold to, uh, to tenants. So we've now got to find ways of actually mitigating that. Um, and as we grow this, as we work together and as the supply chain grows, we'll find better ways of doing it. So we take our building, we take off the tiles and we put a new air tightness layer over the roof. And then we put an airtight layer that goes down the walls and to the DPC. Once that's done, we will then put a heat, heat recovery ventilation system around that building and fix that onto the wall or in the loft, depending on where you can fit the unit. But it runs outside the building because what we've got to try to do here is to stop the amount of um, problems we have with going in those properties. So we want to keep the disruption to a minimal. And by doing everything on the external and just drilling the holes through where the MVHR goes, we've got no pipes trying to run through that building. 
and we've got that void then that can house that building and then be completely insulated. So we've airtighted the building, we put our MBHR system on, where they're going to um, put a new facade on that building. So that building can be uh, existing render or brick, and we can make a brick to render and render to brick. And we can make that look whatever you want. The only thing that's going to be in the same positions is the doors and the windows. Um, we're then going to put the new facade up and then we're going to inject that with insulation. And that insulation is going to run up the walls and across the roof and continually give that a quilt um, from the foundations up because we're going to get a U value around the perimeter of that building of 0.47. Um, and that's going to stop that heat, that coldness from actually coming out around the perimeter at ground level. The MVHR goes on and that's going to ventilate then the building and give us those air changes through the heat recovery ventilation and reuse up to 80% of that energy that we've already created in our houses will be reused continually. So it's going to drastically cut down the amount of energy that we do. And we always in BT Passive try to get as near as Enerfit as possible. The previous one you saw, a uh, block of flats actually is Enerfit, and we're working on uh, a few schemes now that will deliver that. But it all depends on size and shape. But as near as possible, we're working to those passive house standards, which really guarantees those, um, those improvements. We're going to also then put new triple glazed windows in there. So we've got high, high insulation, high windows. We've got MBHR. We can then put photovoltaic cells on, batteries uh, as such, and really make that house ready for the next 60, 100 years. And that's the key to doing deep retrofit. It's not a just bit here, bit there, and just continually paying out money. It's fixed at point of cost. So uh, that's what BT is about. It's about doing it right and doing it once. The other thing we need to do is we need to get buy-in from the clients. No one wants disruption. So when you do it off-site, of course, it's a lot faster. The panels are made in a factory and they can be dropped on. And so you can do a retrofit there within sort of 15 to 20 days and you're away. Um, so it, it needs to be fast. And BT Passive have had good training now about how we engage, how we get buy-in from clients, which is really important. So they understand the, the, the downfalls, they understand the benefits, but I think also they understand the long-time benefits, not just for their pocket, but also for their health, which is really important. So limited disruption is really important. The transformation, and I think it is a transformation from your lower stock, your uh, F type buildings to an A and A plus. That's what we've got to achieve. We're talking about carbon reduction, but we've really got to get on this journey now and really show those carbon reduction. If we don't go as far as this, if we don't do it and prove it, we're just kidding ourselves and wasting money. The health benefits, as I say, are really important. And we know that because we had finished some uh, in Birmingham where we've seen uh, one of the tenants there actually stop using a, a puffer because the air and the health improved so much with the heat recovery ventilation. She wasn't in a damp building anymore. She was in a really healthy environment. And of course, in, with MBHR, there's not so much dust around. You're, you've got pollen filters. So we're really gonna see in, in passive house generally the, the benefits of living in a really good, healthy air quality building. The comfort levels are great. You're living at 21 degrees against the window in the middle of the room or laying on the floor. So we've got that comfort level where our bodies are really happy with at 21 degrees. And we've got to have flexibility. BT Passive so far can do all the buildings that it's been challenged with. Uh, we can't always do it to the 300 mil, um, and in some we're working at the moment around the Grenville Tower uh, estate. Uh, we've only got 30, 30 odd mil of insulation in some areas, and that's that's not ideal. But we've got to we've got to work with that because that's about architecturally. There's no room. We can't make the doors any different. Uh, so we've got to balance that out. But as long as we know that, as long as we're open, as long as we can we can uh, affect what effect that does on the actual calculations and the running costs, then that's absolutely fine because nothing's perfect. And we've got to actually work together to get a solution that actually heals that problem. And of course, the big one, we've got to get to zero carbon. And I think that we should be retrofitting two properties every minute at the moment. We're not doing any, we're just about to start. And the legalities of planning and the legalities of, of, 
um, getting this up and running is huge, but we've got to start and we're starting it. We're starting it with the uh, energy sprong uh, and working with our partners with BT Passive is going to be working on many projects across the UK. And that's really exciting. It's got to start somewhere. We've got to get it prices down. We've got to get more of them done. And it's fantastic that uh, we are lucky enough to be part of that early adopters. The customer journey, um, it starts really with, with architectural survey. So what we've been doing at the moment, uh, we've been doing about, about 100 uh, cloud surveys around the properties in, in London. Um, that cloud survey comes back to our architects. They then panelize the system. Uh, that goes off to our MVHR uh, designers. They design the MVHR systems to fit in. And then we bring all that together in BIM and we, we actually gonna make the panels and put the MVHR and we are going to be retrofitting these properties in that 3D BIM process. The engagement is really important, as I said before, and then it's around about the contractor and how we all work together. The enabling works has to go through, and that's being done on these projects by the main contractors. They're the ones that are going to be putting the scaffolding up. They're the ones that have been taking the roof down. They'll be doing the decoration. They'll be doing the digging out around the perimeter, and that working together is really important making sure that you've got your contractual side and you've got your supplier both working in tandem because it's a very complicated issue. And with road closures and cranes and wind and rain, you wanna make sure that everyone's working in, in a line together to make this happen. Once that's all done, then we've got to test the buildings. So again, we thermal image buildings, we air test buildings, we test the, um, the way that we're going to get our hot water, our air source heat pumps, our electrical heating. Uh, and there's many ways to actually make this work. Uh, with rising energy costs, we've got to look at both efforts. We've got to look at the, the amount of energy, of course, now we've reduced it massively. You know, we've gone from something like 158 kilowatt hours down to 20. Amazingly different. Um, so we don't need that energy. And that's the key to this. If you do a retrofit right, you don't need that energy. So whatever cost it is, you're only using a small amount of it instead of a large amount to try to keep warm. So this slide here just shows you the way that we're going to be uh, lifting panels and fixing panels onto an existing building. Our U values for our walls is 0.11, which is below passive house. Our roof's the same and our perimeter U value. Our air tightness is, is going to be around about the one, but we can't guarantee that at this stage because we, if we're in a semi-detached or a, a, a terrace, we've got to rely on those walls that are next door. Um, but we're aiming for that and we will look to eradicate that and improve that by working in lofts and around sockets and seeing how we can improve that as we work in those homes. And our sound again is very good. So you're, we finished some down the, the um, airport uh, in Birmingham and you couldn't hear yourself speak, it was dire. Uh, finish that um, retrofit and the people couldn't sleep at night. It was so quiet. Um, took them a while to get used to the quiet in, in those buildings. So it's uh, anyone who's been in a passive house would know how great it is for, for noise transmission. The panels are all designed. So these are all designed. These ones are going up to a, uh, a Nottingham uh, retrofit. Um, and they're all pre-made in the factory. And then we just crane them on onto the actual unit itself. Um, the ground floor detail there, for those of you techie, you will see that um, the building actually stops at DPC level, uh, ground level is 150 below, but the insulation carries on below. So we get that continuity of insulation down to foundation level. It would be great if we could actually go under the floors, but to get into people's properties, to take all their flooring up, to move all their furniture, to insulate those floors are just not possible. Um, so by going down to the ground level, getting that perimeter U value really can start to cut down that heat loss around the perimeter. That unit was when we're going to hang it on. This system is exactly the same. You get the same uh, achievements in U values and perimeter U value and air tightness, but we're actually going to be fixing these brackets on, on the building. And then we've got a hanging rail and then the facade. So this is where we can't get cranes. This is where we, we, we've got difficult to treat buildings. Uh, or this is where we just need to do it faster. So we don't have to do all the surveying. We don't have to do all the pre-planning, but it takes longer. So we get to site and we just do it. 
Um, so we're going to be using both ways. We're going to find sites that we're not going to be able to get to and others that are going to be really simple to get to. Um, but that's why BT Passive is a solution provider. We've got to find ways to do every building and do it right. And that's what we're about. Just showing you the same floor detail, the ground detail there as before. Told you about the MBHR. This one does look a bit complicated, but there's only 75 mil uh, pipe and we've got a 300 mil void. So if you can imagine it's well insulated all the way around um, that process, they're all actually one length of pipe. So there's no joints in them and they can be cleaned. And if it ever goes wrong, you can pull another section of pipe through that pipe um, to actually bring another pipe in inside it. So, um, uh, you know, it is, it is a, a trunking um, and it can be used to be lined. The MBHR systems that we're fitting on majority of properties you'll see on the right there will actually be in a, in a door in the actual panel itself and that will be a passive house certified door uh, or, or, and that will be open from the outside where you can get your maintenance to that thing without going into the building again. So we're thinking about maintenance, longevity and those things, the way that we construct the actual MBHR systems. These are some we're about to do. Uh, as you can see on the top left, we've got some F-rated, very, very poor buildings, uh, and they're going to come up to A plus net zero. Um, uh, and it's a very exciting opportunity for these people. They are cold. They can't get the temperature up. Um, the actual construction is a three by two timber a stud work in those uh, cross walls uh, with a piece of OSB board and a bit of paint. Uh, and it's got 75 mil of insulation, which is probably only down to about 25 mil. Once we've opened them up, it's all just lagging there. So no insulation, freezing cold, very difficult to heat. And they're going to turn into A plus buildings. And the life expectancy of those buildings, you can appreciate, is then regone for 50 years. And I think that's what we've got to look at. This is about a regeneration project for these buildings. This is about taking them on for the next 100 years. And this is about having people that live in comfortable health homes. And I think there's a cost to that, but we've got to look at the cost in a different way. Same things really with these ones that we finished up in um, Great Yarmouth, this was uh, recently. Um, they couldn't get above 16 degrees with the gas central heating on full time. It just wouldn't happen. So that's the problem. They couldn't even get warm when they were spending their thousand or whatever pounds it was to actually heat them. Um, and now it's a completely different story. Now they're healthy. There was one lady uh, in the top right of the building there that had hundreds and hundreds of animals in her flat. She was very anti us coming in, very anti us doing the job because of she had all these animals. And I'm not talking about dogs and cats. She did have dogs and cats, but she had hamsters and mice and God knows what else. And the place absolutely smelt. Um, we did talk to her. We told her what was going on, we engaged with her and her husband. And throughout it, I mean, these were carried out through COVID. This was a very difficult time for everybody. Scaffolding was up. We couldn't go in. Um, but now they're in and it's finished. It's massive. And there's no smell in that building. It's transformed their life. Uh, so it's absolutely amazing. Have a look at the picture on the left there. That's the picture that you would expect to see on 80% of our housing stock. We're heating the environment, we're heating CO2, and that's what we're going to actually have to sort. And if you look on the post retrofit after it's been BT passive, um, there's no heat loss. Phenomenally different. And those pictures really make me feel that we've got a chance. We really have got a chance of beating um, climate change if we believe and if we take those early steps um, and we've got we've got the right uh, situation now where we've got everything in the right order to do so we've just got to take that leap of faith and start doing it a few uh, a few more techie bits uh, reduction in gas um, look at the left look at the right for the same period um, ridiculously lower you know crazy 80 percent um, so uh, it does work. And this is also, this was done a few years ago at some we done in Solihull where the temperature there, you'll see a lot of the um, uh, blue squares um, temperature trying to get up to, um, to uh, heat those buildings, just couldn't do it. 
uh, and the humidity as well was all over the place. And yet, when we finished the retrofit, wow, what a difference. What a difference. So we know over years now, and I say we've been doing this nine and a half years, and the one that we've done nine and a half years ago is still delivering on those very low running costs. How are we going to do it? How are we going to pay for it? How are we going to make this happen? I think that we've got to look at joined up thinking. I think the revolution that's coming now in the offsite manufacture gives us the opportunity to work together with partners to not only do new build and do it in factories, but do retrofit at the same time to bring together uh, a new generation of young people. There's been articles all this week about how we're going to get 3,000, 300,000 new employees. How are we going to get new people to retrofit? How do we get them to do it in this level? And it's about working together. And we're setting up relationships now with many councils and HAs to say, how do we put not only a retrofit factory there, but a new build factory and bring it all together? The bottom picture you'll see there is to what we're building at the moment for our modular. And that's coming together, which is uh, 50, um, 48, in fact, one, two and three bedrooms, apartments. And they could be there for a day or 100 years or more. Um, they're all passive house certified net zero. Uh, buildings um, and uh, it's about trying to think of ways we can bring all this to happen because if we can get labor new jobs we can get zero carbon housing zero carbon retrofit it's going to pay for itself it really does it's very exciting and if we get the social benefits right if we get a factory doing retrofit and new build we've got new jobs we've got new training we've got new skill We've got retrofit, which fills in the gaps or the, the hints in, in new build with planning. Um, and for every pound spent in that local economy, we're getting two pounds 70 odd back. So, you know, that's paying for it. That's paying for everything we're doing by putting that money back into the economy. And I think that's the key to us really working on retrofit. It's about how we're going to make pay for it, where the good of doing all this pays for itself. And we just got to wake up to that. And we've got to invest more money to get more money back. And I think that in the end, it will happen. It really will. So some of the properties we're working on uh, across London, as you can see, there's many, many different types. Um, and it will be, you know, it's only too pleased to we'll be arranging visits and discussing this on a, on a you know, monthly thing, monthly agenda now, because we've all got to talk about it. We've all got to get it out to our colleagues. We've all got to see it going on and we've got to understand the cost and how we're going to reduce cost. You know, we have got to find ways of making sure that we can reduce costs, keep quality and do more of them. Um, and I think there's new funding models that are going to come. Certainly the energy strong model with the energy plan is, is a good model and it, and it works. Um, but we need more like that. We need different investors coming into this marketplace. And certainly a lot of the financial institutions now are very keen to see how they can help and have a long term return on these buildings. So there's lots of change that I think will come come about. The big thing is cost, though, as I said, but we've got to do the fabric right first. Whatever you put in an air source heat pump where you, you don't insulate right, all you're going to do is you're going to need more and more heat to actually heat that up, which needs more and more electricity. As you know, they're going to have to run continuously. Um, they're going to have to give bigger radiators, bigger pipe work. And of course, if the heat is still going out the building, what is the point? But if we insulate that building first, and put MVHR on, whatever we do in the future or in this program will not be wasted. And I think it's so important that we really look at that first, cutting that and the kilowatt hours a building needs to heat itself and get it in that heat recovery ventilation. So we're reusing it is the really that the future that we need to bring into every single program that you're thinking of. Just by putting a bit of EWI or a bit more insulation in the loft and maybe a heat pump really is not doing any good um it's a start and i'm not against it but you're going to have to redo that again and again and again until you get to the stage where it's just become far far more expensive so please look at the development models you're doing look at the way that you're going to be spending that money and the return on that money and think about it as a collective with everything you're doing in your development programs making sure that you can actually get the exact more benefit out of your pound that you're going to spend and make sure that it's coming back to you. The next stage is uh, retrofit is our T Cozy Plus. 
across the UK, there is thousands of three, four bedroom, four storey buildings. And we've got to look at how we can build on top. And a lot of boroughs are thinking this, but I don't know they're thinking about zero carbon, the existing stock. And that's what we've got to do. BT Passive T caves, he goes over the existing building and creates new buildings on top. And again, with the factories, with the self-built, sorry, with the modular build and with the retrofit, you've got all the skill sets to be able to do this to your existing housing stock. So you can see the one on the left there where you've got a, a house in London, a flat in London that's probably worth, I don't know, six, seven hundred thousand pounds. You're putting a new tea cosy up the top. You've got curve appeal of that building now. You've raised that building value and you're getting the new penthouses on top to pay for the whole uh, development. So it's something that we've really have uh, got to start looking through your portfolio on. These are some we done for Croydon, uh, looked at for Croydon Housing uh, Council, I think it was, where those properties on the on the right were three, three, four storey. Um, again, no insulation, all cold, very much like the ones we had at a Great Yarmouth. And then the designs we done to put new properties on top. And I think for some leasehold blocks where we're looking with architects today, thinking about their, their um, designs, you know, we can take those blocks and really modernise them and put some phenomenal properties on top. And say the decarbonising of all the existing stock, giving that, giving that client down in, in those flats, no running cost, a healthier living, and of course, uplift in that property value uh, is very, very uh, encouraging for them. And I think something that we'll be seeing a lot more of across the, uh, across the UK in the, uh, in the coming years. Oh, we still already. So there's a lot to take in there. I am very happy to take questions and Ken's here to, uh, to meet up with you and to discuss things further. Uh, here at our factory, we've got our retrofit uh, models. We've got our house here that we took down to homes where we um, had that showcased. It's a, a bungalow, which is retrofitted on one side and the existing building on the other. So you can see exactly how things go together. Uh, and we're very happy to discuss with you your, your build programs. We have got a big partnering program now with many of your contractors. Um, so we are partnering lots of different people across the UK. And we've got to think of it as a whole. Please go away from this thinking, how can I bring this development? Retrofit and building new homes needs to be thought of together. We've got a massive challenge. We've got a homelessness that is just bouncing out of control. And we've got a retrofit program that could take every penny that we ever, ever produced. So uh, we've got to try to link them together to make them work. Okay, thank you very much, Ron. So over to questions. We had quite a few through on the Q&A box. So I'll just start going through. And apologies, we don't get a chance to touch on all of them today. We have got the list and uh, we'll be following up with you, but we'll try and get through as many as possible. So a um, question from Alan is, um, great system for retrofit social housing, but do you have any strategies for delivering this system to privately owned housing stock? Yes, it's the same system. Um, it would do any house is possible. Um, I think the, the planning process needs to be adjusted uh, at the moment. We've got some properties where we can get um, uh, planning allowed under, under permitted development rights. Uh, some we're having to go to planning. So we're doing house types. We're taking a whole range of house types to the London boroughs and saying we're going to be um, uh, retrofitting these type of house like this. So we start to see a streamlining through the planning. And I did actually um, do some feedback with the planning minister to look at how we can improve that process to get it quicker. You know, we when you're retrofitting a house that is like a semi, it's going to stick out like a sore thumb. It really is. Um, but we've got to be able to take that as being the new norm uh, and that when someone uh, we find new mechanisms to help people to retrofit the their house next door they will come out to the same sort of levels of energy efficiency so it's the same system uh, we can fit retrofit many buildings um, and in some areas like we've done in our one the first one nine and a half years ago um, that transformed that building into a very modern with new extensions as well and currently on our um one of our uh, present projects, uh, which you can actually follow on our website, uh, is taking a Shelley bungalow, uh, a private Shelley bungalow, and putting a Georgian uh, rectory over the top uh, and incorporating that old building into the new uh, new Beta Passive T Cozy and reducing the energy to benefit so zero carbon. Thank you, Ron. 
Now, the next question from Tony is regarding retrofitting the floors, which he's questioning whether that creates a thermal bridge around the ground floor perimeters. Right. There's no thermal bridge between the ground floor perimeter because, of course, you've gone down to the foundation and you're picking up the edge of the building. There is a thermal bridge that goes down and underneath, which becomes a, a lesser issue. It's still an issue. Um, and ideally, as I said before, we'd like to go in and insulate all the new floors. And in some retrofits, that's been done, and I'm not against doing it, um, but it's a cost and it's a disruption. So when we've got to do these on a weekly basis, I think coming up to this current programme, we should be doing eight a week um, of retrofitters across London. Um, that's a huge amount of organisation and we can't decamp people. We just cannot do it. So lifting all the carpets, going in there, insulating all the floors is coming really difficult. Um, but, you know, I, I agree, it's not the ideal solution. Also, we've got to ventilate those existing floors as well because what the last thing we want to do is to stuff up floors which have been open ventilated timber floors so the NVHR trickles ventilation through those floors so we've got to make sure that whatever we're doing now doesn't cause us problems in the future but going around the perimeter certainly works and what we've done up to now and the ones we've tested are even the ground floor one which I think was one of the um, ones that we've, we've got the feedback from from uh, a year through the monitoring by Oxford Brookings University saw an 80% reduction in heat load. Perfect, thank you. We've had quite a few questions on costs. So yep. what would you say the typical three, four bedroom property would cost a retrofit? Okay, so we're doing that at the moment and it's really difficult, uh, like all things, different archetypes, different contractors, anywhere between 80 and 60, something like that at the moment, thousand pounds. We've got to get down to the 50 mark to make it really start to run. I think we can. I think we've got to get up. In Holland, they started off at 150,000 a unit. They're now down to about 70,000 a unit. They've done 1,000 of them. Um, different tenure, a lot easier uh, house types because, of course, a lot was rebuilt after the war. Um, they may even be lower now, to be honest with you. There may be a lower cost for that. Uh, but I believe that we can. But we've got to work together. And I think that's where it comes into a whole development program. That's where that's going to we're going we're gonna to happen. But we've got to do it properly. I mean, this is this is taking out the existing gas boilers, putting heat pumps in, doing PVs, um, brand new facades, insects and the MVHR, redecorate around those windows. It's a big job. It's not just sticking the plaster over it. Thank you. Um, a question from Andrew. Does Beach Passive have specialist installers or can anyone install? Right. We have a training academy. Uh, we install um, and we're looking for partners to install around the country. Um, it, with all BT Passive build processes and everything, it's a, we're a technology company. We are knowing that the, the, the construction industry at the moment is totally broken. We've got a massive shortage in, in, in uh, new people coming into the market, new young people. And so we've got to train more people to do this. So, no, I mean, it's a growing market. Please contact us if you want to, want to learn how to do it. Um, Burns asks, can you manufacture panels for typical 1930s semis that has bay windows? Yes, basically. We can do anything. I mean, the more smaller panels, the more details you have, the more um, it is. But what we're doing in the future, and this is something uh, that BT Passive are working on at the moment, is around how we screen print the fronts of buildings to keep that lovely detail in a Victorian terrace um, villa type buildings. So at the moment, we're doing very, sort of, I would say, bland type properties, the, uh, the sort of early ones. And as we move forward, we've got to find ways of doing these more Victorian London type uh, properties that have been there from the 1920s, etc. Uh, and that will mean that we are screen print the front to match all those details. We'll put that on the front and then we'll pump up behind that. And that will give us all that detail in back um, in that building. Uh, it's a few years off yet because we've, the technology is catching up, but that's the future of uh, retrofit, undoubtedly. Suzanne's asked, have you done a mid-terrace Victorian property? No. But saying that, uh, we're doing many, we're doing very, we're doing many mid-terrace uh, in this programme across London. Uh, not Victorian, not showing all that detail, again, more plain. Um, but uh, in the future, we will be doing every single sort of house. And also we'll be doing hotels and, um, and, and office blocks. And, you know, we've, we're talking about housing here today, but hospitals, schools, all any property can be beated it can be tea cozied it, it's the same philosophy it works so you know it, it's not just about residential although i believe the biggest problem we've got is residential 
And I guess similar to along a similar line, um, how do you deal with individual houses in a semi-detached or terrace situation? Okay, so you're going to actually have a 300 mil step in that building. And it's going to look weird for a while. Um, actually, you get used to it. I mean, the drawings we've been doing and the designs we've been doing, the CGIs we've been doing, uh, just start to show that. Um, and there will be some on our website and you'll be very welcome to come and see the ones that are going to be, be um, constructed uh, very soon. So you're going to see a step and that step is going to take a 300 mil leap out the middle and then drop back round with fire stopping all the way around it. Uh, BT Passive is very, very, again, on the ball with fire. Uh, we're working with the design team on Grenville Tower for retrofitting of the Grenville Estate. Um, so, of course, all of this is, is around about making buildings better and thinking of those lessons that we learned in the past. Thank you. Um, Dale's answered, um, so you mentioned that the TCO is designed to last 60 to 100 years. What about the MVHR system built into the facade? Does it need a regular maintenance, replacement? And if so, how accessible is it? i.e. can only be No, the actual uh, MVHR system itself uh, does need maintenance, and that's why it's in an accessible area. It can be in the loft, it can be in the house, it can be outside in the facade. Um, for most organisations, it's good for housing associations to have that externally so they can come along and clean those filters, uh, and all that can be taken out and then put back again. Uh, as I said before, the pipes are, are inside on, in, the, in the building, going around the outside the building. Uh, they are just actually single single pipes uh, they can be pulled out again and pushed back again um, and pulled back through again with a cord uh, if they need to be replaced ideally uh, we can also seal them going through if they in 20 30 years they uh, they, they create a hole um, but realistically they they are meant to be there for you know 30 40 years of maintenance they're you know they're not going to go anywhere they are 75 mil round um, and they will just lay in that in that void Thank you. There's been a couple of comments about the aesthetics of the retrofits when finished, which probably sounds not to the taste of some people on here. Um, but some question, a question from Bernard is about the facade, facade finishes and whether you can use stone fronted finishes that can pass conservation. Uh, yeah, time. any finish can be put on. It can be put on site or, or off manufactured. So, yes, stone, brick, um, timber cladding, that makes no difference. Because we're going to be air tightening the actual building, because we're going to be pumping the and injecting the um, uh, void, all we're doing is putting a rain screen to make it look nice. So any um, any facade treatment can be carried out. Yeah, I think the important point to note here is down to our clients. So our client define the look and finish of their properties of what they're wanting to achieve. So it can be any architectural finish that they're looking for. Yeah. Um, whether it's, you know, we've had, we've had projects before where they've actually wanted to match what was existing there because they didn't want the neighbours across the road to um, be jealous of the new retrofit. So it is very much down to the client, um, but any materials can be, yeah. can be used. And in fact, in London uh, and across the planet at the moment, the permitted development rights or the, the right to, to go for planning says that, in fact, if you keep the existing dwelling looking similar, to that, then you're, you're duty bound to get planning. So I think there's a big planning bit here that also lines with that. Um, is there an issue of planning with a 300 mil step? There is, um, but it's one that councils are now seeing that you know, it's the only way to do it. So certainly in, in the Nottingham ones, in the Great Yarmouth ones, it was all developed under permitted development rights. Uh, we've not had to go for planning in Birmingham or in, uh, in Solihull, um, but we are going to plan in, um, in London, but that's a house type. So all end terraces, all mid terraces, all detached, they're all going, this is what it's going to look like. And there's be 300 of them. We're not looking at individual ones. It's just, they're going to look like this. So I think there's a, a real understanding from the planners now that, that this is the only way that we're going to be dealing with our properties and we're going to have to expect everybody else in the future to bring their lines to meet the new ones that have been done. And it's happened in Holland. I mean, there's an outcry originally, and I can remember seeing the first ones and thinking, wow, they look weird. Um, but when you think about it, you know, who's wrong? One of these properties are low running costs, they're doing right for the environment and they're healthier, and the other one isn't. So, um, you know, it's got to be taken into in perception. Thank you. We're getting close to the top of the hour. So just do a couple more questions and then um, we will get back to all of you with the answers as well. But um, Roger's asked, um, from a moral imperative, he can see that it works, but economically it would be difficult to justify as an investor. 
are there any grants available? Right. At the moment, uh, there is a lot of money being put in around for housing associations and councils. So we're the ones in London are part of the GLA £250 million grant that's gone around 50-50 match sort of thing. Um, but we need government to really um, push money behind this. We're looking at the decarbonisation fund. We're looking at ways where um, local taxes uh, will be reduced when you're starting to uh, do, do, um, do these sorts of retrofits. We're looking at how we can pay for it through the savings uh, over a period of time and how low finance can come in to, to help this. There's a lot of interest from the, the big finance houses now to be part of this, seeing this as, as the future. As you know, investment now is being really pushed into these sectors. So I think there will be new funding pots, there will be new grants. What we've got to look at, I think, is, is your asset. And will people in the future be able to live in houses that are cold and what value is going to be on that? Um, so I think we're going to see a little tilting uh, of property values. Um, so your bank and your building sign and what you can borrow against buildings that have been retrofitted and have got low running costs and prove those running costs uh, is going to make a difference, both in new build and, and in the retrofit sector. So Miriam's asked a, a very useful question is, what do you think are the most significant barriers to retrofitting our existing housing stock? And who would you say, uh, as campaigners, what should we lo be lobbying about? What, would you, what messages would we get? Okay, I think, I think the biggest one is, is going to be cost. Um, and the biggest worry is we're going to continue doing little bits. People are, are, are banding around, there's a £25,000 retro bit, zero carbon. You're dreaming. That's a real, real problem that we've got to address. If you look at what you get for 25,000, you can't retrofit that building to 300 mil down to a, a, a proper, um, so you can't put MBHR in, you can't put new windows in for that and new roof coverings, it just doesn't have money. So I think that's the biggest problem that we're facing. We're not facing up to a big enough problem. We're thinking that we can do a quick fix and we can't fix it now, but we fix it in 10 years time. And then we fix it again in another 10 years time, which is gonna cost us a hundred thousand pounds by then. And we're, gonna, we're not gonna save all that carbon in the meantime. So I think we've got to lobby against doing it right. Thinking about this as a holistic approach to it, don't think it in isolation. And what we're doing at the moment is looking at isolation, just saying a heat pump's gonna solve our problems. And as much as I like heat pumps, it ain't gonna work. It really isn't. Thank you. Um, David was asking about structural warranties. So he's wondering if um, people are looking at poor performance delivered by um, retrofits in the past, is that impacting ability to get structural warranties? I think it depends on what you're doing. BT Passive have got a structural warranty that we can bring through when we do it. And I think the companies coming forward to do this uh, are gonna need that. I mean, the new, the reason that PAS 35, and those of you who don't know about PAS 35, it's a new regulative uh, process and there's new now PAS uh, coordinators, uh, retrofit coordinators. Now that's come about because of the history of poor retrofit uh, and now to get funding from government you've got to be pass uh, 35 um, assessed so we're seeing that change and out of that is now we've got a coordinator who needs to make sure and sign off that this work's done properly so this is this is great really good but it's going to really slow up that overall delivery because people have got to do it right now and i think that that is the future of how you know retrofit that wants those warranties behind it we can't make those mistakes we've made in the past you know there's many of people that have put heat pumps in and they haven't upgraded the boilers they haven't put bigger pipes in you know and they're paying more money now and getting less less heat out of them um and they pulled them out of the properties and, you know we've got to do it right we've got to do insulation ventilation insulation ventilation is everything so i think you know i think that the insurers the the mortgage people are going to want to know that these properties are right and people are not buying homes that are going to cause the asthmas and the grade on cancers thank you right a couple of more slightly more technical questions uh, one from margaret so how do you safeguard the 300 mil wide timber ladders when they go below dpc level and how do you extend the DPC to be sure there's no rising damp? Okay, so what we do, we take a, we seal the building at DPC level. We then take a radon barrier DPM that goes from there and round. 
We don't take timber below DPC, it stops at DPC because you can see by that joint, we actually just take the insulation down. Uh, so there's no timber below DPC and no timber below 150 millimeters of, of external floor level. Um, so that's all normal building. We'd never do that. Uh, and that's gonna be uh, always the way that you do. We also uh, have a fence drain at the bottom to let any moisture out of that, that, that bot, that could absorb any moisture that, that could get into that void. Um, and it is about making sure the detail is right it's a simple detail um but you must expect water will get into buildings it always does so it's going to make sure that there's a channel for it at the bottom that it can it can it can go into okay another question from margaret is what is the embodied energy level of the insulation material that you're blowing into the cozy void and is there a choice in the solution to it? yes there is i mean we've got two types we use a, a bead uh, which is far, far better for moisture um, and really good. Or we use a rock wall type material that is pumped in as well. So, you know, you've got a choice there on different materials that you can pump into the void, depending on what you are, depending on location. You wouldn't put rock wall underground, but you would put bead there. So there are options and there's also cost as well, implications in those options. But, you know, we're going to get new materials come forward. And the exciting thing about where we are in a moment in the retrofit and insulation thing is we are going to see new materials coming forward, new ways of of insulating and able to get better lambda values in those u values so we can actually make that void smaller uh, so it's exciting times uh, mark's asked are there discussions with ricks to try and get the cost benefit of a retrofit reflected in the value it's coming Passive House, BT Passive started Passive House 10 years ago um, as one of the early adopters in the UK of our new system. We, bought, we built now over 450 of our passive homes around the country. Savills think there's going to be an uplift, and I think that that's even more now, more prominent because of the cost and rise of, of, uh, of uh, energy. You know, looking at the existing housing stock where you could be paying £2,500 a year or £2,000 a year heating costs up against £200 a year, that's a big difference. That's a lot of income. That's a lot of uh, uh, mortgageable income that we can actually put forward. So I think that if we can guarantee these and something that BT Passive has been trying to work on and will work on is how BT Passive will be able to guarantee those energy costs. So I hope that in the future, anyone who lives in a retrofit or anyone who lives in a, a new BT Passive home will be able to guarantee that their costs will be in a set range. Um, and if it isn't, then the insurance will pay out because we know that if we test our buildings, we do our buildings right, then that's the way it works. We know through technology, if people go out and leave the doors open or windows open or turn the um, turn the um, MVHR off, that that will be able to be proved because each house now needs to be monitored. You know, we've got smart meters, we've got technology coming through it, and certainly the ones that we're doing under the energy sprung, every one is being monitored for U value, it's being monitored for heat use, it's in the heat loss. Um, so we will know and we will learn, uh, but would it be wonderful where you can have a home and know exactly what it's gonna cost you, and then you can budget accordingly for your mortgage or uh, your, your holidays to the south of France. Um, question from Alan, why is the UK government using ridiculous low estimates for deep retrofit of building stock? What can it do? What can it do? Uh, in the end, it's about let's get started. And I don't blame them. I think if they told everybody that we need to spend all this money, it, it wouldn't happen. What we've got to do is we've got to realise what we're getting for it. You know, if I'm only going to get £25,000 and I'm only going to reduce my energy by 10%, Fine. If I'm going to spend 60,000 and do it by 80%, that's the difference. So we've got to be realistic. I pull my hair out with these figures. Uh, anyone who's in the business knows that it's ridiculous. But where they start, you know, and no one wants to face up to it. If I faced up to all the things on radon gas, we faced onto the cost, we'd all go home. So we've got to realistic. We can only do it if we start working together, if we look at it holistically, we take notice of the industry saying we've got to do it right. And people say to me, look, I can do 10 properties and do three of yours. I want to do 10. But what's the point of doing 10 badly? What's the point of doing 10 which causing problems for people? And you've got to do them again and again and again, because that will never solve the problem. So we've got to do them right. And I think that's the argument that BT Passive is trying to put over. When we do a job, we do it right. And it's done forever. Okay, final question before we round up. So Rod has asked, um, I'm not quite sure whether he means testing or certification here, but how is the post implementation certification performed, particularly for flat box, um, flat blocks and successive terrace rows? 
Okay, so the testing basically is um, once that building's been assessed originally, uh, it's then retrofitted, it's then air, uh, air tested, it's then thermal imaged. It then goes on to a monitoring program. So that will be monitored, MVHR, humidity, um, uh, cost, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a band that it fits into. Uh, and of course, if it's fitting outside that band and it's inspected again and found out why that is, it could be human error, it could be the building's not performing, it could be the MVHR has been turned off, but it's monitored and it's guaranteed over a 30 year period under the energy spawn model. So I hope that some of that uh, that modeling and, and um, ways of in inspecting and getting that continuous look at those properties. It may be one year inspection and it may be something in the future, you know, that will be shown. Look how my properties um, uh, performed and that will, could be related to your, to your council tax or to your, uh, your selling price or your rent in, in the future. But what I do know is that, you know, we're going to see a huge rise in fuel poverty. We're going to see a huge rise in, in uh, the health effects of people not living in colder homes, um, you know, and overheating homes as well. You know, again, if it's not ventilating properly, if it's not done properly, our buildings are going to overheat. So, you know, passive house is looking at all of that. Overheating is just as important as, as uh, uh, keeping warm. Thank you. I think that's unfortunately all the questions we have time for now. Um, but any that we haven't managed to answer today, um, Ken will come back to you directly uh, to make sure you have got the answers to all of your questions. Um, but thank you very much for your time. There will be a recording made um, of the webinar be available, get that sent around to you. So if any of your um, colleagues or friends um, haven't had a chance to see it and would like to, then please do forward it on. Um, if you do have any specific questions, then please do come back to us also. We'd be happy to answer any of those um, directly. Um, and as Ron mentioned before, we'd also be happy to you know, organise any meetings or any visits you'd like to come to the factory. Thank you very much. Thank you.